Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to North Kirk Presbyterian Church. Um, I hadn't checked the forecast, but it doesn't feel bad. <laughs> um, would you please uh, uh, stand if you're able and join us in our first song?
Good morning. Good morning. Good to be back, and I'm so thankful that the Lord uh, blessed us as a congregation, uh, bringing the word these past couple of weeks through uh, Mary Brown, our uh, resident nurse practitioner, <laughs> as well as Pastor Rob Aker, and uh, to hear the stories about the relationship between uh, CBC and uh, North Kirk, or uh, as it was known back in those days, the Lutheran Congregation over the years. Then it was uh, Agape Fellowship until 1993 when the Lord called us to do his mission work here. So very thankful to hear those encouraging words about taking care of our bodies, the bodies that God has given us, and praying for our city, praying for our neighbors, knowing that when our city uh, is blessed because of goodness, we also will be blessed. So this morning we will continue back in our summer series going through uh, the letter, Paul's letter to the Romans and seeing how the Lord continued to grow the church in that first century uh, when the name of Christ was unknown, the title of Christ would have been unknown to most people. Well, if you're joining us online this morning, welcome to you as well. For those of you that are joining us from Cadence uh, as well as other parts beyond, uh, thank you for uh, joining us in worship. We all come together uh, before the Lord's throne to give the Lord thanks, uh, to praise him for his care in our life, and to hear his word and encouragement for us. Our prayer is that we will not be the same as we leave this worship service, as when we entered the doors or turned on uh, the internet this morning uh, to participate in worship. You'll find if you're here in the sanctuary, uh, we have our fellowship pads. Uh, those are intended there. If you have any change of information, contact information, or otherwise, or a specific prayer request that you would like uh, to have handled by our office. Uh, for those of you online, you have information on how to contact our office if you would like to update us with any information. Uh, you'll also see in our announcement sheet, we have a campus workday. That's that uh, usually that first Saturday of each month uh, to come and to share together works side by side, uh, even with our campus partners, uh, to take care of this land that the Lord asked us to uh, hold in responsibility in 1993. Uh, so uh, thank you if you're able to come. You don't have to stay for the entire morning. Uh, even uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes would be appreciated. Uh, we appreciate just the energy that comes from being together, taking care of what the Lord's given to us. This month, our food of the month, uh, for those that uh, we bring food who are short of food is macaroni and cheese. How many of you love macaroni and cheese? Raise a hand. Yeah, it can be craft or otherwise. Uh, boy, there's just something good about pasta and uh, the wheat that pasta is made from and that cheese. Uh, so good. So if you're uh, at the supermarket, remember to drop in an extra box or two and share that uh, so that the Lord is known by the gifts of his church. You'll also see that we have an ongoing school supply drive um, for classes, uh, which will begin here in Rancho uh, August 2nd. So the summer is quickly kind of coming to an end. Uh, so we will be uh, uh, aggregating those. And uh, we're glad to know that uh, our uh, fellow um, followers in Christ at, at Cadence have put together uh, an assembly of, of food for those that are needy of food. And uh, we're going to be inviting them as well to participate uh, in our school supply gathering. And then finally, you'll see that uh, at the end of August, August 31st, we have our blood drive, which we did two years ago. And uh, so this is just the gift of life. If any of you have ever been in a hospital and have been the recipient of a, of a unit of blood or more, uh, you know the difference. You are the walking difference that that makes in another person's life. And so if you are able to do that, or if you have neighbors that are looking for an opportunity to... Uh, uh, to bless someone else. Uh, let them know so that they can sign up. There's a sheet at the back of the uh, sanctuary, a red sheet, red all over it, uh, to sign up for, uh, I think it's 15 or 20 minute time slots on the 31st. So thank you for signing up for that. Very good. And with that, let me invite you to uh, bow your heads and let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, how good you are uh, to give us the gift of life that we are not an accidental creation but that we are exactly lovely who you made us to be, like no one else who you look down upon and you cherish even as we sleep. You gather us together. Thank you for redeeming us by your Son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you 
that you lead us through the hours of every day, that you lead us in this time of worship so that we will not be the same as when we entered this morning. And to you we look, in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. And now let me invite you to stand as you may be able to. Join me in the call to worship taken from Psalm 37. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord. And wait patiently for him. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. Amen and amen. Please remain standing as you may be able to. Let's join together in our opening hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Amen. Please be seated. Would you please join me in the prayer of confession based in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Heavenly Father, only you are the source of righteousness, our good judge, Yet you have given all judgment to your Son, our Lord Jesus, who has taught us. But somewhere early in my life, I came to think I too could judge others. And when I have, even my standard has not been true, so that in turn I am judged by others and I fail as well. Holy Spirit of truth, Help me to see the log in my own eye and lead me to remove sin in my life so that I may care rather than judge my brothers and sisters. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hear the words of the Apostle Paul to the first believers in Colossae. Encourage them to walk in new life worthy of the Lord. For the Father has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son. He loves in whom we have, re have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 13, 14. In Jesus the Christ, we are forgiven and led. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another with a physical greeting or a wave as you are comfortable. Waiting for my counterpart, sorry. Slow but old. Have you ever wondered how you might be able to serve the church? If so, have you ever considered being an usher? Good morning, my name is Thelma Campbell and I serve as the Music, Worship, and Arts Elder. I'm, um, today, Debbie and I would like to share a little bit about our usher ministry. Our ushers participate in our worship service by greeting people at the door and providing them a bulletin. So all you need is a smile and a hand. It works. They may assist members to get their name tags out of our beautiful constructed uh, name tag holding board. They work to prepare the sanctuary for worship and doing a little cleanup after service. Collecting the offering during service is another part of their service to the congregation. The, the commitment could be as small as one Sunday a month to help this is a vital part of our worship service. Debbie's going to share with you about what it is to be an usher and what it means to her. Please consider helping in this important ministry. Please see David Van Curen, our head usher, or myself if you have any questions or would like to become an usher. Plus, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. 
So feel free to put your name down once, twice, or every month, whatever. But anyway, ushering is not a job. It's a lot of fun. You might think, you know, when you see us running around crazy, but it's really enjoyable. Like Thelma said, we come in early, half an hour, get the pews and your programs and everything you guys need to go through church. And then after you guys are done, we go through again, pick up trash that somebody might leave or extra programs. Just have it ready for the next congregation that comes and shares with us. It's not hard. I don't know, I enjoy it. Me and my sister started getting our t-shirts, you know, with our name and I'm sure you see the back. And we try to get many colors so we can match the cross, but sometimes we're not kept up with certain people back there <laughs> on the colors, you know, they're always changing it. Um, we do the offering, passing the plate, which we still all make mistakes, and I've been doing this, what, five years, four? Oh, okay. For a while now. We're a team. Yeah, and I still make mistakes, because you got a partner, and I don't know what she's thinking, and she don't know what I'm thinking, so if you mess up, who cares? I mean, we're all family here. It's not a big deal. Um, the best part is when you all come in the, in the morning. David will look for your tags. I'll try, me and Sarah will try to greet you with the smile and welcome you as you come in. And sometimes we do it as you go out. Yeah, it might get boring to see our face, but you gotta deal with it, okay? <laughs> but ushering is fun. I suggest that if you've never tried it and really would like to get involved for the new people also, come see us in the back or a sign up sheet if you wanna talk about more of it. We'll be more than glad to share our thoughts and what we've gone through. Anyway, that's about it, so thank you. Thank you, Debbie. We will now be accepting your offerings. If you're a guest today, we want you to know that there's no expectation, and we hope this service will be a blessing to you. Christ loved us so much that he gave himself as an offering on our behalf. Let us follow Christ by giving our offerings with joy and thanksgiving. Will the fun having ushers please come forward to collect the offering?
Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord, we bring to you these offerings, the greatest of which is our own very life, each one of us here in attendance, those that are online, Lord, seeking your face with us. We give you ourselves as an offering. And Lord, take us, use us for your goodness in this world, for those that you love. Thank you for the gifts that others have shared through the week, for gifts that we hear and we feel, for the ones that will be shared with our neighbors. Bless them, draw others to your name, Lord Jesus, for we offer ourselves and these in your name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you. Your music took us all back to our childhood, Harold. <laughs> that was fun. This <laughs> the scripture reading today is from Romans 1, 16 through 25. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the f Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith. For faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Well, we uh, will uh, continue, as, as I mentioned at the outset of the service, uh, to go through the, the uh, of the lighthearted uh, letter of the Romans to the Romans uh, during these summer days. Um, it, of course, it's, it's a profound letter. Um, as we talked about a few weeks ago when we first entered the letter, um, Paul has lots of different reasons for writing this letter to Rome. Uh, it is the center of the world, at least the Western world at that time, Rome. And uh, we'll see by way of what Paul even mentions in passing as part of this passage, how important it was that Jesus had a congregation in Rome. It was the center of the Western world. And Paul longs to visit Rome and to share a gift. We'll see more about that. This portion that we're reading through is right after the salutation, uh, which we covered a couple of weeks ago. This portion is going to talk about honor and shame. Now, we don't uh, often use these words very much these days, uh, though I do remember as a child, maybe more than some of you being told, shame on you. But we don't hear that as much these days. Uh, we who today in our culture, in this place where we live, we fiercely hold to the idea of uh, the pursuit of life, liberty, and of course the pursuit of happiness, that is whatever floats your boat. And so along with that, it has become increasingly rare to hear anything like shame on you. 
We read those words out of the Declaration of Independence. They are part of our national culture, who we are. But we all feel the reality of these two things, honor and shame. We feel them every day. In fact, they drive us through the hours of every day, honor and shame. They are another way of declaring what is good and what is bad, honor and shame. And so we, we navigate the choices of our daily life. Should I drink a can of Coke or should I have a glass of water? We think, what would others think? What do I think? Will I be respected by my choice? Will I not be? Again, we don't use those words honor and shame, but will they see it as something that I've done that's good, taking care of my body, or something that is not as good and will challenge my body <laughs> in a fit of sugar overload? Although I did try Coke Zero, and uh, hey, it's not as bad, so for what that's worth. All right, so uh, we live through the hours of the day with honor and shame, making choices on this. And in fact, um, we do that because we make our choices based on what others will think about us. And so will they respect us or will they look down upon us? Now, because this is a reality, we will go to the extent that we then choose our friends who we want to to confirm what we like. So if we don't want people to criticize our root beer float, we'll find friends that will also drink with us our root beer floats, right? Real easy to do that. It's called confirmation bias. We're looking for people who think and act the way that we do so that we feel honored, respected by the ones that we hang around. And then, of course, that leads to the other side, which is Jesus in the culture of his day would use the word hate. We probably wouldn't use that word, but we might disagree or argue or deny others who disagree with us. Let's say that A&W root beer is bad or otherwise. So we make an effort to reinforce what we as a group agree is good or bad. And we live with it. This is, I mean, there's, even though we don't talk about honor shame, it drives us every day. And so, of course, it's going to be in a song. You knew it was coming. <laughs> it's before Elvis, but it's after Big Band. Well, we're coincident with it. It reached number one on the billboard. R&B, and then later, number 10 on the pop chart. Sold over 12 million records in 1958. You made me cry when you said goodbye. Ain't that a shame? My tears fell like rain. Ain't that a shame? You're the one to blame. You broke my heart when you said we'll part. Ain't that a shame? My tears, they fell like rain. Ain't that a shame? You're the one to blame right? You're the one to blame. Imagine that, 12 million records, having no problem saying, ain't that a shame? Yeah. We don't hear it very much anymore. But the words speak to something that's bad. You broke my heart, and I'm left here in tears. And that we shouldn't treat one another that way. But each one of our choices is a choice to do something that's good to others, good to ourself, or not good to others, not good to ourself. But we have this thing that God's given us, free will, free choice to make the choices that we will make. 
God gives us that ability. He's made us in his image, God who has free will and free choice. God who freely sent his son to rescue us. And so, of course, many of us go to our grave defending the choices that we have made. Even when, maybe in the back of our mind, in our conscience, there is a worry, there is a doubt that God may not agree with what I've chosen at every point in my life. And we all have things, we all have things of which we are ashamed to have done or we continue to do, hoping that God will forgive these. And so the good news, it turns out, the gospel is a lot about shame. Paul declares in this passage that he's not ashamed of the good news of the gospel. Though there were many, many who would have been ashamed in that age of the gospel and were following Christ. And there may be many among us, we might not choose the word ashamed of the gospel, but we may act in a way that implies that. And so this good news is intended for all of us who bear shame. All of us who bear shame. Avoiding this worry that we have that God might be angry with us, would not forgive us. But Paul's going to reveal in this passage what God's response is to our shame, and I think you will be as surprised as I was and am. So we come into this passage. As I said, we've covered the salutation, and Paul opened up with just that huge, you know, canon that this is not his good news, that this is God's good news, that he's fulfilled his promise from thousands of years through the prophets and through the history of this people Israel. He has sent his son. He's allowed his son to die, to redeem us, to die in our place for our sin, for the purpose of our obedience by trusting him who is alive today. Jesus, the risen Christ. So it's this relationship of trusting in his teaching through the hours and the choices of the day that will redeem us, that make us people that will inherit eternal life. And so in that salutation, of course, Paul thanked the Roman church right after what we covered a couple weeks ago. And he says specifically that their faith, their trust in Jesus is proclaimed throughout the world. Why would that happen? Because it's Rome. It's the reason that people say, you know, they're wearing this in L.A. It's because it's L.A. Rome, if you had believers in Rome, people in Ephesus might listen to you. People in Alexandria might listen to you. There's a church of followers of Jesus in Rome. Paul thanks them for that. And then he explained his long desire to travel, to impart to them some spiritual gift, but also to receive a gift from them. And so Paul now then steps into this passage we come into this morning to explain the good news as he understands it. He preaches what he believes is absolutely needed by everyone in the world because every one of us has shame. So Paul begins and he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, Paul's not implying necessarily that the Roman believers who get this letter are ashamed of the good news, but, big important but, We've lost this sense through two millennia. Worshiping a man who was crucified for sedition itself was ludicrous. It was scandalous. If you told anybody that you worship someone who was alive, who was crucified by Rome for trying to overthrow Rome, 
they would have just thought you've lost your mind. You're an idiot and you're a fool. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Far easier in that day closer to Jesus' crucifixion for people who have said, I don't want any part of that. If they hear that I respect or worship someone who was crucified, that all automatically puts me on the bad list with the local soldiers. Automatically. But Paul says he's not ashamed of that. On the face of it, the core of the gospel that Jesus goes to the cross for us. Most people would have heard that and they just would have walked right away. They would have walked away as soon as you said that. And we can imagine how many people did just that when Paul would stand up to preach in public squares. But Paul, even in the synagogues, would have people walk away when they heard about someone that was crucified. And yet Paul, he has this opposite feeling. He's not ashamed. Rather, he's boasting in God's good news. He's boasting. He cannot wait to share this with people who don't know yet that there is a way to deal with their shame. He wants others to hold the same view of the gospel as he does, to not be ashamed, but to know that we also can hold this wonderful, lovely, God-given gift to deal with shame, both to empower our own witness to others, but to empower our very own life to deal with the things that I am ashamed of and my walk with Christ. So Paul goes on to say that the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation. So, okay, real churchy words here, so you know I like to give alternate translations. The word power here, it means capability. For the gospel is the capability of God for the salvation. Salvation, that word can also be translated as rescue. So it's the capability of God to rescue everyone who has faith. And so this everyone meant everyone in the world. Everyone in the world. This everyone having faith. Now, we've talked about this so many times. Faith, the same word underneath there can be translated as faith or trust. And in this case, when it says to everyone who has faith, it sounds like it's a thing. Remember from Saturday morning, ABC schoolhouse rock, a noun is a person, place, or thing. But in this case, Paul wrote a verb, not a thing. It is to everyone faithing, or we would say to everyone trusting, everyone trusting in God's good news, in what God has done. And so our active, continual trusting of God, and let me add to this, eternally. It doesn't end. The trusting doesn't end when we get to the pearly gates and we give them our ticket and we go in. We trust God forever. This is what we were made to do. It's how we bring God's goodness. And so this active, continual trust is our ticket to heaven Our ticket is not an agreement to the question, do you believe that Jesus died for you? It is the active verb of trusting God through the choices of the day that will make us feel good rather than ashamed. For in it, Paul says, in the good news, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed through faith for faith. And again, this can sound very, very churchy. Um, What Paul is trying to get across here is the idea that God is the first one who's demonstrated faith or what is faithful, what is trustworthy, and that is himself. After all these millennia, God has faithfully delivered on the good news that he promised 
through all the prophets. And because he is faithful and can be trusted, our response should be to respond likewise with trust. From faith to faith, or we could be translated from trustworthy to trustworthy, that we become trusting of Jesus following him. And so to underline this, Paul then quotes another prophet of the Old Testament who made the point out loud, his name uh, is Habakkuk, um, that the righteous shall live by faith. And it had to do at a time just before the Babylonian uh, exile when Judah, uh, that southern half of Israel, was no longer faithful, trustworthy to Yahweh but depended upon themselves. And so God warned them through Habakkuk, don't let the proud believe that they are right. There's something wrong with their soul, for the righteous will live by faith or by trust in Yahweh, in Yahweh's guidance, in His Word. And so Paul underlines that also for us. And then he has to add this, to the Jew first and also the Greek And of course, we've known, because we've talked about this over the years, between all of Paul's letter, in that first century, there was just very real tension. Very real tension that I have no doubt broke out in arguments, or worse, in the congregations of the Lord, in the flocks of the Lord. Because people viewed the Jewish people distinctly. People lived in segregated ways then, And so to come together under one roof and to have a fellowship meal, a love feast after a worship service, they were eating different things, things that one group, the Jews, would find offensive and perhaps even likewise the other way. So there were lots of reasons for tension. And so Paul has to address why this good news is relevant to both Jews and to Greeks. Now we hear the word Greek and we think, well, what is it about Greeks? Was it something to do with the Olympics? Why just Greeks? And of course, that's a reference to the Greek culture, which was the culture, strangely enough, of the Roman Empire. And so most people did not speak Latin at that time in Jesus' day. They spoke Greek because there was a fellow, of course, named Alex that came through about three centuries earlier, conquered everything, taught everyone Greek, and, uh, and they spoke Greek even into the day when Jesus um, was walking the earth here. And so in that first century, when Paul and his team would come into a city, they were very, very clearly Jews. No one would have said, are you a Christian? Because they would have said, Christian, what, what are you talking about? They were Jews, they were a special sect of Jewish people who had found the Messiah in Jesus. But they were considered Jews. And so, in every synagogue throughout the Roman Empire, there were Greeks, that is, local people who spoke Greek, whatever people group they were part of, who respected the Jewish people and saw in the way that the Jewish people treated one another a goodness that didn't exist in their own culture. And they wanted that. And though they might not have taken all ten steps to become proselytized, they would lean into the windows of the synagogue every Saturday morning on the Sabbath, and they would listen to the proclamation of the Scriptures, and they would take that home and try to live their way by that. We know that this is the case because Jesus, in the Gospel of John, got the signal from the Father that his hour had come when there are Greeks that traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover and asked his disciples to meet with Jesus. They were Greeks. They were people whose ears listened through the windows of the synagogue. And so... Paul needs to make the point that these Greeks also were included in this good news of God, that they too would have God deal with their shame. All right, we're going to go through this uh, at at a faster clip here so I can get done on time. As because we all have shame, we all know that we've done something that we regret, Paul wrote this next. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Ah, the W word, wrath. Not very popular in our day and age, the wrath of God. Uh, How many of you have ever encountered a wrathful person? I think some of us at some point, don't look at Lorraine, she'll point to me. (laughs) Maybe our parents when we did something wrong. Um, wrath is a scary word. And uh, it can really mean two things. Uh, I mean, well, it has two sort of connotations with it. Wrath can can, uh, be used when it is really focusing upon the emotional part of it. But there's another way that you can use wrath, which is focusing upon the response to what has angered you how you will deal with what has angered you and not so much the emotion. So if you have ever been, or maybe you had a parent who they didn't have to raise their voice and yet you knew you had done something wrong and they took action when you did something wrong. And so what what we think of as wrath might not have been as much an emotional response as much as a quick action to nip that in the bud, to discipline us, you know, if we needed that. So God's wrath, and I want us to notice this, God's wrath is revealed. Literally says in the Greek, is being revealed. When Paul wrote this letter, let's say it's about 58 A.D., God's wrath in 58 A.D. was being revealed. And we read this today in the year 2024. We live in a time when God's wrath is being revealed this morning. Huh. This surprised me. So we think of wrath as judgment day. Yeah, there's going to be some wrath on that day. But what Paul is saying in his gospel is right now, God is angry. And we hear that and we think, yeah, but God is love. And I would be the first to say to you, yes, that's right. God is angry and God is love. And the two perfectly exist in our good, good father. We may not have had that experience with other people who have been wrathful because It's so easy for anger to lead to sin. And so the words of Scripture, do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? It's easy for sin to find its place in there. Here's what the reason for God's anger, His wrath. His anger is, is, wrath is against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Paul uses two words there that are translated in English, ungodliness and wickedness. The first has to do, uh, it's more literally translated, impiety. There is a disrespect for God. And then the second word is, uh, is, uh, is wickedness or evil, but it's meant across the horizontal. It's the way we treat each other. So God's anger, he's angry because of the way people treat him, and he is angry because of the way we treat each other and angry, wrath. So we don't want to minimize this. It means a lot to God that the ones that he looks at as we sleep at night with love are treated with love and care. And when we don't treat one another with love and care, that makes our good, good father angry, and he's going to do something about it. Paul goes on to say here, He justifies why God is angry. He's basically answering the question, anyone who would say, well, how did I know God would be angry? Paul goes through some quick verses here that says, no, 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 no. You have known since you were a child that you live in a world that's created by God. Wherever you have come from, you see things around you that you can't explain how they got here. If you think about it more than 15 seconds, you... You have to be thankful for whoever created the water cycle and for seeds and DNA that goes through generation and makes more pomegranates. You don't have to think about it very far. You know there's a God. 
And yet because there's a God, and even though there's a God, you have chosen to ignore that God. You've chosen to say, I'm going to make my choice, not the choice that God would have me make. Now, this part of God's revelation is, is, is referred to as natural revelation. So many people on the earth, most people on the earth did not have access to the Mosaic law. Maybe most people did not have a Holy Spirit speak to a prophet through them. And yet, as C.S. Lewis would say, there's something put in us that we're made in the image of God that we have this sense of what is good and what is not good. And when we hear that voice in us that says, don't do that, that's selfish, we still do it. And so God is angry about that, the way that we disregard His guidance and His care for us and what we do to each other for that. And so because of that, how, what does God's wrath do? How does He take an action? Okay, you ready for this? This maybe is the most surprising thing. God's response to our evil is to let us go with it. Do you ever have a parent who knew you were doing something bad and let you scab your knee really bad or worse, maybe end up in juvenile hall something to get the message to you. You can't go on like this. And this is what God does in His wrath. He is angry, and He allows us, who He's given free will, to pursue the lusts of our heart, even if they're selfish. He allows us to do that. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. We know the son who audaciously asks his father for his inheritance even before his father has died. And we know well the story of him going off and spending it all and then coming back on his hands and knees. But maybe we've never stopped to think what the response was of the father when the son asked for his inheritance. He was angry. Wouldn't you be angry to say that you don't matter to me? All that matters to me is what you have that will be mine, and I want it now. Jesus gives us that parable to show us not only what we are like as prodigal sons and daughters, but what our Father is like, the one who actively did something at that point. He let his son have the inheritance. God allows us to pursue the lusts of our hearts so that the resulting shame that we will feel will bring us back to him. We're going to have to call it here. Uh, and of course, we'll go on as we continue uh, into Romans. But here's what I want us to take away from this, is that God can be angry we can be angry. God is love, and we can love. And Jesus went to the cross because He loved every one of us who's filled at some point in our life with something of shame. We too can be like the Father, and we can be like Jesus, and we can be filled with grace even though we might be angry. We can care for other people even when we allow them to use their free will. We can wait for them the way this father of the prodigal son did, never being against them, always being for them, always wanting to draw them back, knowing that God made them uniquely in His image and that God wants them also like us to be with Him forever. We don't have 3D today because uh, I, I get to preach in Temecula at 12. And so I'm going to need to say a prayer here. And then uh, I've asked Thelma if she would give the benediction for me. But let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your cross, the scandal of it. And yet, Lord, you know 
our shame. And you have given us a way to be able to say, that is behind me because you lead us, you lead me. And so would you be blessed, Lord, as you transform our hearts for our neighbors, whatever their choices might be, to love them as you do, to be grace-filled as you are. We ask this Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our faith, for providing a way to take away our sins and our shame. We can give that to you. We thank you for our many blessings. We sometimes forget that all we have, everything we have, comes from you. We take the credit for our own accomplishments, not giving you the thanks for putting us in the positions we're in. We're sometimes arrogant, thinking what we have or what we've done is only by our own hand and not because <clears throat> you've allowed us the success. We ask your forgiveness for our arrogance, Lord. We're thankful for a little bit of cooler weather these last few days and for whoever invented air conditioning. <laughs> But we ask you, ask that you be with all those who have to work outside in the heat and watch over the firefighters especially who are suffering. Father, all over the world this week, people are watching the Olympics, the young athletes who are living in unity with others from different countries, cultures, different faiths and beliefs. And I pray that the world will capture and hold on to that spirit and joy of these young people. I pray also for our own country, which has been so divided. I pray that we can find common ground and treat each other with decency and respect and kindness. Lord, I thank you for the comfort that you've brought my friend Nancy and her family after the loss of her grandson. They have felt our prayers and your presence and are blessed. We thank you for Becky's successful surgeries this past week and ask that now you will give her relief from the lingering pain. We are grateful to you, Lord, and all who prayed for Violet de Leon who had a successful cataract surgery on her right eye. And we also pray for a successful cataract surgery on her left eye Wednesday. We pray for Carol Jenny's son, Tim, in Oklahoma, who is recovering from emergency gallbladder surgery. And we ask for prayers for Pilar's family friend, John Picara, who is awaiting a liver transplant and also prayers for Pilar's family friend who passed away this week and for their family. Prayers for Susie Enoch, a friend of North Kirk, who has been hospitalized this week for, with sepsis. Uh, prayers of healing and comfort for Annette Garcia's grandmother who is still suffering from a broken back and prayers for Debbie's family as they wait for her aunt to pass. And thank you for your prayers. And Lord, uh, or I ask you to join me in the prayer that our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
If you are able, please stand and join us in our final song and sing with us whether you're able or not. <laughs> <laughs> for your grace and mercy. <laughs> so this morning, an hour ago, Martin asked me to do some benediction. So we are a family of God. We show each other grace and mercy. Thank you. And I wish that we all go out and be blessed by God this week. Our memory verse is, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.9. Good God Almighty